So uh, with that, uh, I, uh, let's let's go ahead and introduce our panel. We've got three panelists today, um, uh, all of whom are uh, have really very impressive track records uh, with uh, conducting and publishing um, influential uh, research syntheses on educational topics. Uh, so I'll just quickly introduce them. Uh, first off, we've got uh, Dr. Amanda Neitzel, who is an assistant professor in the Johns Hopkins School of Education. She's also the Deputy Director for Evidence Research at the Center for Research and Reform in Education at Johns Hopkins. Um, she's uh, published many research syntheses on topics in elementary and secondary education uh, on things such as effective reading programs, math programs, school-based mental health uh, interventions, and whole school reforms. Uh, uh, second panelist is uh, Carlton Fong, uh, our, our um, uh, program co-chair. Uh, he is an associate professor in the Department of Curriculum and, and Instruction at Texas State University. He holds a PhD in ed educational psychology from UT Austin, and he's published many, many meta-analyses on topics related to student motivation and instructional strategies uh, with a particular focus on student success in post-secondary post contexts. Uh, our final panelist, Dr. Pong Pong, is an associate professor at the, in the Department of Special Education at UT Austin. Uh, he did his PhD in special ed at Vanderbilt University. And like the other panelists, has uh, a really impressive track record of producing meta-analyses using very sophisticated methods uh, on a range of topics uh, related to reading and mathematics learning. Uh, I kind of think of Pong Pong like the way, the way some people uh, binge watch uh, Netflix I kind of imagine Pong uh, like binge meta-analyzing things. Like some, you might come out of like a Saturday afternoon going, man, I just watched like six episodes of Billionaire Island. And Pong, Pong comes out, go, man, I just published four meta-analyses on topics related to <laughs> uh, uh, student motivation. Um, so um, we're just going to have a conversation for the next hour. I've got some questions uh, that I've uh, uh, called from people, uh, and we'll kind of lead off with that. But um, uh, if you're listening in, please feel free to add your own questions and thoughts in the chat, and we will monitor the chat and try to work those questions in, uh, or call on you if you're uh, if you're willing to uh, to share your questions uh, 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 verbally. Um, so with that, I thought maybe we could just spend a couple of minutes getting to know uh, y'all. Um, so I would love to hear like the maybe the short version of your of your origin story. Like how did you get into this game of of uh, research synthesis? Uh, and maybe we'll start with Carlton. <laughs> I love that question. I know. I just think of like a radioactive effect size that bit you or something like that. Um, <laughs> so um, my first exposure was actually through the Campbell collaboration. Um, so a really great organization focused on um, synthesis work in the social sciences. Um, I did my first systematic review um, on individuals with autism and employment interventions and um, it was working with John Westbrook and he invited me to this project and he said, would you want to help on a systematic review? And I was like, I have no idea what that is, but sure. Um, and I think that just really launched for me this, um, this now is just an enduring desire just to want to know the entire state of evidence on a certain topic. I think it's just like an insatiable curiosity now. It's like, I can't just read one study on a topic and be convinced of the findings. I need to really look at the entire corpus and actually think about research quality and think about the diversity of studies that is on a certain topic. And that's really kind of, that's been the bug that really has bit me, so. Uh, Amanda, do you have an origin story? Um, sure. I mean, so part of it, this starts back before I became an academic and I was a public school teacher and I loved that. I loved teaching elementary school, um, but it's a hard job. And it was especially hard because you know that there are people doing research in education and you're just not seeing that make a difference in your life as a teacher. And you think there has to be a way 
people are learning things about how we can best teach and instruct and kids learn. How can we get this into schools, which is actually what drove me into a PhD program. And um, I feel like mine was a little similar, Carlton, where I, I was, I did a directed reading on program evaluation. And the very last section of it was about like research synthesis as, you know, you do all this evaluation and then, yeah, they synthesize things and there's some, some methods. And I thought, well, this is kind of interesting. And my, my advisor was Nancy Madden. And I, I said, I, you know, I kind of like to know more about this. Don't they, they do some of this here at CRRE, right? Cause I was a student at Hopkins as well. And she said, yeah, 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 we do that. We can get you an appointment with Bob, with Bob Slavin. So I show up just to ask like, what's this all about? Like, what do you do with reviews? But actually that meeting was him saying, we have money to pay you. You'll work 40 hours a week. Here's your cubicle. It already has your name on it. Here's the directions to sign in. Here's the form to fill out for your parking pass. You are going to update this review on struggling readers and also help us on this one that we submitted and it was rejected for secondary reading. You need to figure out how to, in, you need to figure out how to weight by inverse variance. Can you do that? And I was like, I don't really know what a meta-analysis is, but sure, sure, I can do all these things. Um, and yeah, have never looked back. And a lot of my work is applied. It's not just let's do a meta-analysis and publish it. It's how can we get get that work out there in the hands of people who need it? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Wow, that's a great story. Tom, do you have an origin story? Yeah, so uh, when I was in my PhD program at Vanderbilt, uh, the qualification test or you know exam, usually you have to do a, like a systematic review or meta-analysis. And in order to do that, we have to take a class of meta-analysis. So that's where I started. I remember Dr. Uh, Emily Tanner Smith was back then at Vanderbilt. Yeah, she taught that class. And yeah, she, you know, uh, did a very, very good job, you know, making us understand what this method is. And right after the class, I applied that method to my, uh, you know, qualification meta-analysis, which is my first meta-analysis, comparing, you know, uh, uh, whether there's uh, differences on working memory between different types of learning disability. Yeah, I was, yeah, that's how it started. But ever since then, I was like, okay, I can do more on these topics. And then just keep keep going, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe, if, uh, Pong, I'll give you a follow-up. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, you all have, are now, you know, you've seen this whole process of, of conducting a systematic review a bunch of times. Um, I'm, I'm kind of curious um, about your, your favorite piece of it or your favorite stage of a review and your least favorite. Like, what do you dread the most <laughs> and, and what do you feel like is really like your jam? Oh you... my God. Uh, so I would say back then, like maybe five or 10 years ago, there's not a like software. Maybe I don't know it exists, but there's not a software that I know of that can help you screening the uh, literature. So when I do the literature screening, I just, you know, do in the database and literally just click those little folder symbol to include and exclude articles. I was yeah. really, really taking a long time. Yeah, I really don't like that process, yeah. I would say. But now, you know, uh, I know there is a software like Rayan, you can do much quicker screening. So, but still I don't like screening stage because uh, we, in our group, we usually do like a really large scale meta-analysis. Like, and we are screening usually based on like 20K, you know, papers, that was like too much. So I would say like screening is the least favorite part of this process. My my most favorite part is actually when I try to write out the whole manuscript, try to explain the findings, either significant or not. I think that's the part where I like the most because I feel like that's where I can use the findings to answer some uh, theoretical questions, uh, you know, that can, that is very interesting to me. So I think that is the part I like the most. Uh, yeah. Sense making out of the, uh, from, from the quantitative analysis, turning that into like, or sort of distilling findings. Yes, you're, you're yeah. saying like, yeah. So yeah, I like to, I, I like to uh, interpret the findings in different ways, either yeah. it's significant or not. Yeah, that's that's my favorite part of the the, uh, the whole process. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Carlton, does that resonate? Yeah. Um, 
it was hard to choose a task I dislike the most. I feel like there's like enjoyable parts to each stage. Like, I don't know, like screening abstracts, it feels like you're like foraging for like mushrooms in a forest. Like it's just kind of like kind of fun. And then extracting data, I find it's like, you I try to imagine myself like interviewing the author like what did you do like how did you go about this study and so maybe I've done this so long I have now like convinced myself that all dreadful parts are likable but um I would say probably if if I had to choose one <laughs> it's more of a part of my origin story too but for my a dissertation I had to do a lot of um, full text retrieval of like old dissertations and theses and these were on microfiche and like microfilm and so I did interlibrary loans to receive these like boxes and reels of like microfilm and and microfiche and the in interlibrary loan person put it on the cart and they said okay the microfiche machine is in the basement so I remember pushing the cart down to the bottom floor basement and I was there for like days like going through all these microfiche and I felt like I was like a detective like going through old newspapers like scanning all these microfilm and it was sad when undergrads were coming up to me asking me questions like do you work at the library and I'm like no I'm just doing my dissertation on a meta-analysis right now so I would say if you have to do full text retrieval on microfilm and microfiche it's pretty dreadful but but call you is essentially what you're saying. No, right? don't call me. <laughs> I'll give you sympathy, but no help. So okay. <laughs> Amanda, do you have a um I mean I think I agree with both I love I love reading the full text articles because I feel like a detective. Like they don't they never give you all the information. This is something that just kills me. They never give you all the information you need. And so you have to like hunt through it. It's like, where can I find it? What can I infer from this? Where can I get it? And then also try to figure out what are they not saying that I should know about? What are you trying to hide with this? Because I'm super skeptical when I read papers. Yeah. Um, and so it's it's like this fun challenge of like, let's see what's wrong with this. Let's see if we can find what's wrong with this paper. Um, and then, you know, once they actually get in, that's great. But I also love the interpreting the results. Like when you run that first analysis and you get those tables and it's like, oh, what does this mean? What does this mean? Um, you know, significant or not, how, what does this mean about what we know? Um, the thing that I dislike the most, and this really plays into, I hope you don't have this problem. I really dislike writing up the papers for journals. I would love to just like, I oversee our evidence for us. I work like slap it up there, slap up a technical report and move on. Going through the whole process of preparing something for a journal and then like writing the cover letter and then doing the revision. I hate all of that. Um, that's oh. the part I just like the least. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, there, there's, there's a lot of reactions in the chat too about which pieces people, people are motivated by and, and <laughs> what they dread. Yeah, Carlton, you mentioned author queries. <laughs> Yeah, that's I'm 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 impressed with you all that that Bill Chell can keep such a positive attitude about it. I just feel like when I, I start to get grumpier and grumpier when I do data extraction, I'm like, come on, folks, just can't you just give me this number? Why does it have to be so hard? But um, I think I want to uh, so I, you know uh, maybe you know moving on from uh, from from the getting to know you piece of this. Um, I know one thing that one question that I know has been on a lot of people's minds in the SIG is uh, just thinking about like if you're starting out in the world of systematic review, um, approaching how to conceptualize and plan uh, a review project. Do you all have, I mean, do you all have like a method or like maybe criteria or thoughts about, about you know, identifying a good topic for a review? And open to anyone who wants to pick that up. I mean, a lot of our work is about identifying specific interventions that work. So it's thinking through what, what are the questions people have? Like decision makers in the field, what do they need to know right now? They're making decisions around X. Okay, there's, you know, they don't have a good resource for that. Let's make sure that we can get something that's usable and can help them make that decision. So we're generally not contributing to theory. We're sort of working on which specific interventions or types of interventions 
work in schools. And that also overlaps. And this is sounds so terrible, but like where you can get funding support. Um, so a partner reach, I mean, our family engagement work is the perfect example of this. Yes, I think family engagement is incredibly important. Um, would it have been the top next project we would have worked on? I don't know, but the national PT had reached out and there was a great opportunity to do this work. So we're doing it. So it's sort of that combination of what, what are we hearing from people? You know, what information do they need in the field to answer questions right now? And then where can you get that, that funding support to help you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just add not in, a, in addition to that, um, you know, questions from the field and from practitioners, I would also say like theoretical inconsistencies. I think that's like what really draws me, like when you go to a conference, you go to ARA and it's like, it's unclear, right? That the findings are mixed and there's competing theories about how a certain process may work from motivation or cognition or something like that in student learning. And um, yeah, it, it's just neat to think about what would like how would theory be extended or challenged based on the findings of 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 this synthesis um and so that that kind of helps guide me in terms of a, a review topic as well as not i'm sure most of us know like don't just pick a, a topic that like randomly pops into your brain like you need to be like kind of immersed in that literature already like i think there should be a fair amount of prior knowledge and background about, you know, what are the key theories, what are key moderators that will explain heterogeneity um, in, in this topic, because I think one of the pitfalls of starting a synthesis where you have very limited background knowledge, that's where you're going to struggle, right? At every stage, at the search strategy stage, at the keyword identification, at screening and coding. Wow, that those are probably times where you probably give up because the way you conceived it wasn't in a great way, right? And so I, I do think setting up the, the topic and the scope really does kind of set you up for success kind of at later stages as well. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, for me, I usually choose a review topic uh, related to my own research interest, right? For example, um, one line my research is focused on cognition and learning. So I always do meta-analysis around either, you know, whether it's a memory and a reading mass relation or how does like a cognitive load theory apply to, you know, multi-component intervention, that kind of stuff. So, I, you know, it's as you doing one of those one topic, you know, as you review and those literature, there are always other topic related topic coming up, which you might think, oh, this could be my next topic of meta-analysis. So yeah, for me, it's like, it's always, yeah, I agree with both of you, like always stay with your research interest and know your own, you know, literature well enough so you can just start doing that analysis on those relative topics, yeah. So yeah, so it's, I mean, I yeah, I hear these themes of like, you know, being very familiar with the literature in a given area, um, being aware of, you know, what the, uh, what the what the relevant theories and even like what the what the key constructs are, uh, how they've been de defined in in a certain area, uh, and then from Amanda also being aware of like what the needs of it, needs of the of your audience are, what the, the the questions that practitioners face. It's interesting that it's like it, you know the the way the so where you're paying attention shapes the contours of the review that you end up doing. It seems like right, Pong and Carlton, you've done a you've done a number of reviews that, that are more like theoretically focused, it seems like. Um, and that so do you have any, I guess, anything about about um like how that broad theoretical focus shapes like the choices that you make when you go to do when you go to plan the plan the study then? I say it makes it right in contrast to right Amanda's reviews are often like you know they're more focused on specific interventions uh, with you know with this particular set of stakeholders or audience in mind. 
So I give you one example about why, okay. So why I think theory is relevant because earlier, I, probably 10 years ago, like when this cognitive training becomes like a new thing, everybody think a oh, working memory training can work, right? But then there's a lot of intervention showing that it's not gonna work that much. Mm -hmm. Then I would just question myself, like if they think cognitive cognition, like working memory is really important for learning, why training is not working, right? Then I realized not many people really look at the correlation. <laughs> Like they're like, if the correlation is only like a 0.2 or 0.3, you know, we know you could translate that into intervention, the effect size could be even smaller. So that kind of inspires me to do some kind of like a theoretical theoretical uh, meta-analysis on the relation between working memory and learning. So I think it it's also driven by what is going on in the field right now. It's driven by the practice, right? But later, when I submit that paper, the, the working memory reading paper to Psych Bulletin, and then during the review process and the editor feedback, I realized like they, you know, you can build up so many theory into this thing, especially through the lens of moderators, you know, under what circumstances does working memory relates to reading? What circumstances does not, right? Like, and there's so many there. I. I realized, oh, okay, meta-analysis can do so much more than just give you like mean effect sizes. By exploring those moderators, you can explain how this relation varies under different circumstances for different samples. And that actually contribute to the development of that theory further. So I feel like that process really makes me realize, oh, okay, um, it's not, it, it, Maybe you're doing theoretical meta-analysis, but you can always find a link back to the practice. Or if you're doing like a practice, practical oriented meta-analysis, you can always link back to the theory because they're so closely related to each other. So yeah, that's my that's my take about this theory. It's great observation. Um, so the other, you know, the other thing that I always wonder about with if you, when you're in the planning stages of a meta-analysis is um well, I mean, uh, Terry's pointing out in the chat, meta-analysis is very much a team sport, right? It's it's like well nigh impossible to do one of those things like by yourself. How do you all think about fielding a team or like building your roster if you're if you're going into the you know big meta-analysis game? What sort of skill sets do you like do you want to have around you um, to complement your own? And anybody, feel free. Um, I could share um, a little bit first. Um, I mean, I'll probably start with some obvious ones, but um, a quantitative methodologist, if you're thinking about a meta-analysis, I think would be great, particularly those with expertise um, in the analytic procedures. Um, I... I like to think of myself as someone that can, that's pretty good at that. But until you work with someone professionally trained in quantitative methods, you're just like, oh, wow, it's so much better when someone else is helping you with this. And so um, so I've definitely learned that, um, it, you know, I think I can get by um, in a pinch. But if I were to create a dream team, definitely having someone um, with those quant chops um, is great. I would also say a librarian. I think someone with um, search expertise like that is often overlooked in these teams. Um, once again, I, I think there's this kind of assumption that, oh, I can get by kind of with what I know, but then there's a whole, whole like science behind this, right? And so I think as much help you, you can get both methodologically and from library science, I think would I would definitely um, say those two for sure. Seeing a lot of vigorous head nodding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hong or Amanda, anything to add? I mean, I was going to emphasize the, you know, see what sort of folks you you have access to at your institution, especially. Um, we just met with our librarian two days ago because we had gotten a response for a protocol we had submitted and um, they were basically like, you have not consulted an, an information retrieval specialist. And we were like, but we do this all the time. I know how to do these searches. And then we met with the librarian. And in fact, I learned two new things. Um, so that was sort of the things are changing. You might be really, really good at it, but her whole job is to understand this searching. So 
you know, she was able to say like, well, this database now captures these other things and they've got a whole new format. Like, wow, I didn't, I didn't realize that. So we'll change. So just, you know, grab, get that. The other person is um, we have folks that focus on um, data management and data sharing. So in the interest of just, you know, keeping track of your data and then in open science and, and sharing it, we have folks that are that is also their job. They know a lot about sharing it and licensing and you know disseminating your your code and your all of that. So if you can find somebody to help you with that, that's also very very helpful. Mm, yeah, that's a great tip. So I agree with Carton and Amanda. Um, you know, definitely have a one person who know R. For in my case, uh, on those very advanced codes nowadays, and definitely ask for librarian. Um, for help, especially the database is really tricky navigating nowadays. For me, uh, on top of that, I also try to include my doctoral students and I try to train them, like even if it's their first year, just get in, right? So I train them to do the screening, to do the literature search. Uh, I usually have like uh, two to three doc students on the team work on the same projects. So I train them, I have like a senior one, senior doc student, who already know what is a, they're doing. The two new ones will train them and do double coding, double screening. And then I think I find this process, one, very efficient for coding, right? You have so many people helping you. Two, it's a really good training for those kids, not kids, students. <laughs> because, you know, only when you go to those literature, finding those numbers, measure names, you really remember, you really know. So it's uh, it's much efficient than having them report an article weekly in a seminar. So yeah. I find that, really, yeah, it's really helpful. You know, like one stone, many birds <laughs> to me, but yeah, that's what I would do to get do, a team. Do any of you all work with undergrads as part of review teams? No? Okay. Our school doesn't have undergrads. I We've toyed with, could we get some from other departments, but um, we haven't yet. But I, I think part of it, I like, I like what you said about get them right from the beginning because even if they can't do everything, you can always find part of it. That we've we've broken up coding into coding, you know, so sort of you're going to do the coding. These these people are going to double code these easier things. These other people are going to double code the effect sizes because those are that's going to be the hardest part. But other people, you can capture the the details about the the context and the intervention. Um, because at least they're in there, they're learning the process. And then the next time, then they're they're ready for effect sizes. Mm -hmm. we, we, we have some program here, uh, especially for uh, undergraduates from psychology department. And um, we can, re actually this one student uh, last year participated in a little bit of our uh, screening process, but but yeah, there there is one existed here, but I I haven't done much with undergraduates uh, on the meta analysis projects. Yeah. Uh, Rebecca, I see your comment in the chat about working with undergraduate co-researchers. Do you can, can you share? Yes. Hi. Um, you know I'm going to put you on the spot. Sorry. I'm totally <laughs> fine with that. Um, Sarah Peco Spicer. Um, is the project director and Josh Palanin is the principal investigator for an update of the Cipriano et al. child development meta-analysis about school-based universal social and emotional learning programs. Um, and they were recently awarded beyond the project I'm heavily involved with, um, a living systematic review. Um, but I am in charge of leading the screening and coding teams which involve co-researchers um, and now some former co-researchers who have graduated and are now managing labs at other institutions but are still involved in the project. And um, it has been a very expensive endeavor, a very difficult endeavor, but I believe incredibly worthwhile to have their perspectives. Um, and I will say that here at AAR, we now have a level two research assistant staff member who is a former co-researcher, was started on our research synthesis as an undergraduate because of her lived experience and showed us what she could do and is now a researcher with that 
participatory uh, research experience. So um, really exciting. That's super cool. That is that is the sort of pipeline that really makes sense, I think. Um, so while we're on the topic of sort of you know planning and, and getting your team together, um, I, uh, I bet I bet a lot of folks would be curious to just hear a little bit of shop talk, like um, about the sort of tools that you use when you're doing a review. Do you um, anything to share about about like the software stack or like the you know tools that you found that make make the uh, the more painful bits of systematic reviews you know easier to manage? Uh, I know, uh, Pong, you mentioned, you know, uh, uh, sort of automated screening tools. Uh, do, do you have a favorite or uh, stuff that you use uh, frequently? Oh, now we we, we use Regan and, and Zotoro for uh, literature mm -hmm. screening. And uh, we mostly use R for the analysis nowadays. Mm -hmm. Similar? Um, I, I mean, I use Zotero for the, I'm a big fan of open source. So R almost exclusively for the analysis, um, Zotero for the citation management. Um, we've been, I started using AS review for my screening and love it. And then I filter that into Covidence for full text, which is not open source, but our, our institution has a license. So that is, it's available. So you use Covidence for, um, for full text. Uh, full text and do you do data extraction? No, it's so, not. I don't. I don't find it flexible enough for education. Um, so I've been using yeah. Meta Reviewer. Oh man. Okay. Yeah. Uh huh. Carlton, do you have? Is that similar for you? Yep, similar. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Um, are there any tools that are like you really wish were out there, um, but haven't been able to find uh, in practice? Or like, you know, what's on your wish list for <laughs> uh, maybe you know software that 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 methods people could be working on? Hmm. I'll leave that. I'll leave that floating out there. Maybe I was going to say I don't know how you would do it, but one of my students mentioned the other day that the the way that I keep track of which searches I've done seems clunky because it's literally like a spreadsheet. And then I'm like, I did the hand search of this journal on this date using, you know, paper fetcher. I did the 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 forward citation chasing on these. So it's it's documented, but it's like this ad hoc. Oh yeah, and then I ran this database search with these terms on this date, and then I did this, and it's just like a running spreadsheet. He was like, should there be a better way to do this than just somebody writing it down? And I was like, I don't, I don't know how you would do it, but I like that. Yeah, it's better way yeah. to track that. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh, and maybe along with this question, that you know, um, there's so much craft in just managing all the pieces of a uh, of a review. Um, do you have like uh, a wish list about like advice books or tutorials that you you feel like somebody really needs to write the like the book on this? Uh, to help to help people improve their practice about some stage of the of the process. I feel like it's almost just participating in a review with someone else. I recently somebody who was leading some of this work at Hopkins on, in another department reached out because they were doing their review and they were very concerned because they felt like they were having to, to calculate effect sizes and code different kinds of effect sizes. And they were worried that that wasn't standardized enough and maybe they were doing something wrong. And I was like, yeah. oh no, 50 studies, they've probably written it 50 different ways. You're, you're doing it all right. Cause she was like, well, they're, they're really coming in like three different kinds and I'm having to do calculations and just, you know, there was sort of like these minor things that because she hadn't been on one before, she was like, is this right? This can't possibly be right. And it's like, yeah. That's that's right. Like, mm -hmm. how often are you not going to be able to find a standard deviation? They're not universally there. Um, so I think sort of the tutorial is before you want to lead one on your own, ask somebody else if you can just participate even in a small way, you know, sit in on their regular meetings, do a little bit of screening just to start to get a sense of, oh, these are the, this is the reality of this. 
are off their queries, they're probably not going to respond. You have to send them anyway, but they're probably not going to respond. Um, just so that then when you do it yourself, you're like, yeah, this is this is what other people are also experiencing. Yeah, that's really good advice. Yeah, I would add, um, I feel like there's a there's a phase in between coding and analysis that I always find a little fuzzy. Like you have all the coding and then now you're trying to reconcile, you know, thousands of rows together and have them all speak to each other in the same way in order for the analysis to run. And so you've coded, you know, achievement outcomes, but of course every study has like, X number of ways to actually operationalize a, a achievement and you want to assess the different moderators in that outcome. And so, yeah, it's like kind of recoding, like recategorizing, re like rethinking about, okay, now that we've coded everything kind of at the, you know, like um, smallest bite sized, <laughs> how do we get it to like an axial code now where it actually makes sense for, analysis and that's where it takes both the like theoretical knowledge of the constructs as well as like the quantitative expertise to to recognize okay those categories are actually meaningful to actually treat as moderators and so i find myself in this phase often wrestling with like okay what's the theoretically meaningful moderator and then what's the like practically analyzable moderator and also not spending years on this and actually just trying to get this done too, which is the theme of the panel, right? Like, yeah. so, so that yeah. phase I feel like is just hard to get like concrete guidance on because it is pretty like synthesis specific, but I, I do feel like that's always a very like tenuous place that I'm in. And I feel like I'm making the best decision, but there's so many ways to do it. And so yeah. I find that challenging. Yeah. That's yeah. That's a great point. It's, it's like the, Right, that the that that weird, like squishy bit before you get to doing the formal meta analysis, where you have to make lots of judgments about. And you have to be like looking at the data, right, and making judgments about it. But you're not, you haven't yet gone on to the formal, like sort of statistical piece of it. Exactly, and you can pre-register, yeah. and you have a sense of what those moderators are going to be. But man, once you actually see the data, you're like, nope. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. it's never that clean. It's never, ever, ever, ever that clean. So yeah, uh -huh. um, so you know, just so you know, still on this theme of, of of trying to get meta analysis done, right? The you know, this research is only so useful to anyone if you don't share it with the world. Um, so you know, we should think about. Uh, I guess I'm I'm curious to hear about like your practices uh, around writing and disseminating findings from the systematic review. So uh, maybe Carlton, do you have any like any uh, sort of advice about write up process? Um, yeah, um, my best advice is to write as you go. Um, I know some people like to finish an entire project and then like you know have their own order of of things to write, but I love having like a little Google Doc like on the side that's like draft manuscript. <laughs> ready to go and then as i'm doing the different phases of the method per se like uh, 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 for example i'm filling in that that section right i'm filling in the paragraph of you know how we did a search strategy once we finished that and so that way well for me i have a bad memory so it's already recorded there in the manuscript and you really do feel like you know, you're making pro incremental progress as you're going versus like doing a multi-year synthesis. And you're like, I have nothing to show for this besides all these Excel spreadsheets. Um, having an ongoing manuscript, I think both organizes you, but it's also like motivating to see that you're incrementally contributing to this large report. So right as you go. So for... Um... For our group, for me, um, we usually uh, we come up with a topic and then we need to finalize the question before we start it. Because usually we have this moderation question 
there's a lot of moderators in it. So, and moderators are usually related to theoretical or practical debate. So we have to spend a lot of time, you know, thinking of the topic and those uh, moderators after we finalize it, then we're like, you know, oh, this paper should, uh, this project when it's published should go to this journal, this journal, this journal. And then we have that like a journal in our, as a go in our mind with that, we're just gonna uh, go ahead and do all those like, um, coding analysis and I think I think yeah I think that makes us like more clear about what we should do in the process and what's the scale of this project should look like because we have that journal in our mind and yeah but that's how our work uh, our lab works on uh, you know making this published uh, um so full disclosure, I'm in a research center, so I'm not required to publish in journals. Um, so I don't publish as much as I probably could or should. But so I don't start with where which journal is this going in? It's sort of this, where can I get this in the hands of people? Is there a webinar? Is there a conference? Are there folks that I can reach out to directly with a five page summary of these results? So I'm thinking, you know, the, the publishable article is great, but I'm also thinking about how can I do these other things as well? And what mm -hmm. I'm, something that's been very helpful because I also don't feel like I'm a great writer and I don't really like to, to write is I have someone on my team who used to be a copy editor for a newspaper, um, which has been invaluable because she's really good at writing. And so Carlton, like you said, like I can keep notes as I go about this is what I did. And then she can turn that into, you know, the appropriate language and she can help so if you can get somebody who actually has really strong writing skills as well, if you don't have them, um, she can help organize while you're writing this for this audience, you know, think about outlining it this way and then let's break it down into pieces. So making sure if you, if you aren't, you know, amazing at writing, have somebody on your team who is, who can help keep you organized. Even, I mean, she's not a traditional academic. She's not an academic or a researcher at all. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So oh, that's really interesting. get somebody yeah. on your on your team. She can screen studies, though. She's been trained to screen studies. Um, so she does she does a lot of the other work, too, but she's not a researcher. Um, yeah. So you can you can think more more creatively with who you man your team with. Sure. And, you know, uh, along with that, Amanda, right, like it's, it sounds like you're you're thinking really carefully about like the different audiences that you want to reach with your review. How, how do you think about like kind of Make, make communicating findings in a way that's going to be accessible and, and meaningful to to the different audiences that you're trying to speak to. Oh, we are not good at that. Um, some of that we summarize this is on a our huge question. I know. I know, right? Like some of that we yeah. summarize on evidence for ESSA. We've tried putting out these like technical reports, but the technical reports ended up being like a hundred pages long, which is not what you want to do when you want more people. Don't make it longer. Um, right. yeah. But so no, now I'm trying to move more in the how can we rep represent the findings in a simpler way, like the important key pieces. And that may mean some of it is visual. It may mean that we end up skipping over details on some things that, you know, researchers may be very interested in how you estimated your standard errors. And that will be located in some report somewhere. But like maybe in this piece that we're disseminating, that's not the main message. We're focusing more on that theoretical piece you know, the big takeaways, um, how certain are we that these results are valid? Um, where And then where are the holes too? I think too often we don't spend en enough time leaning into where are the gaps in the literature. Meta-analysis requires enough studies to do the meta-analysis. And so sometimes I feel like we're missing the talk of what's missing, what isn't there. It comes up sometimes, but um, I find people really care about that too. Mm -hmm. anything to add? I just posted on the chat that for the public, I've enjoyed using a platform called The Conversation. Um, they work with academics um, and journalists together to craft a piece together, and um, it can get republished in like a different news outlets too. And so it, it can get quite a bit of um, attention. And I think um, into the hands of the public, which is really great. Um, um, from my conversation piece, I actually had um, a high school teacher DM me on Twitter and he was like, I just read your piece. Can I use it for my high school class? And I was like, yeah, I mean, you can use 
anything <laughs> if you want, but like, sure. And what was really cool was he actually um, compiled um, their reflections based off the article. And he sent me an anonymized version of all their reflections on the paper. And I was like, how neat, like to see that, like a synthesis you did, like you think, you know, who's going to read this is now being read by like high school students, like in Ohio or something like, like that. So I just thought that that was neat to like, get that like affirmation from, from, from the public as well. So for sure. And how yeah. motivating, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So you, uh, our, my university, UT Austin has a, like a contract with the publisher, Sega. I don't know like which one is associated with RER. So that means like if we as a faculty member associate with UT publish in like journal, like review educational research, it's gonna be open and uh, open resource, uh, open like open resource, like open to the public. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. yes, we are. So uh, that's a good thing. <laughs> that's a that's a big motivation for us to publish over there, because uh, other people can uh, access to the paper over there. And also, I find like sometimes there's some like media reach out to reach out to you, like want to do interview or report about your study. I feel like that's a very good way to you know to um to spread, to disseminate uh, your research to the public. Yeah, so. Um, so the, uh, you know, the, the, the y'all have, you know, so much experience to draw on and, 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 um, you know, so many good suggestions here. I'm wondering if we can sort of pull back a, uh, one level just for a minute. I would be really curious to hear about like how you think about doing systematic review work as part of like, you know, all of your duties as a as a faculty member or researcher. Like, how do you, especially because systematic reviews can take so long to to finish off. How do you think about like managing a long term project like this, and then balancing it with all of the other stuff that you have to do. other than therapy. <laughs> I have found it very helpful because this is not all I do. I do a lot of um, third-party evaluation, sort of randomized studies. Right now it's a tutoring. It's been other things in the past, but we're in a tutoring mode right now. Um, so I think those have a certain kind of like cadence during the year that right now is data, data, initial data collection and randomization. I do not have a lot of time for systematic reviews. But once this is done, it's going to calm down until about December. So I'll have a period where I can just focus on this. So I think my other work has a very sort of non-negotiable, you know, it's good. And then it's going to calm down until the spring when we collect qualitative data. And then it's going to be state standard. We'll be writing. For, so there's sort of this, the, the review work fits in the gaps of everything else. involving doctoral students, I think, and this is how I was um, trained as well, working with Erica Patal, that you, she advises all her doctoral students to do a meta-analysis in their first and second year. And then that becomes, you know, the foundation for what they're going to study for their dissertation and stuff like that. So, um, so the mentoring and the teaching, especially with individual students or groups of students can be, hey, based on what we find in this meta-analysis, you know, that's going to reveal gaps that you could look into in your d dissertation. You know, it's going to, um, as you read a bunch of articles, as we're coding them, we're actually learning about research quality, right? What are things that you should be including in a research study? You know, this is maybe not the greatest example of how you should do this intervention, but this one's a really cool example, right? With some different ideas. And so, we re I try to definitely like think of um, multiple benefits, right, um, from doing a synthesis. It's not just a single project. It's going to inform my future research projects. It's going to inform how I mentor and like the teaching that, that I do. Um, so I don't see it as like a standalone thing that I need to get to because I'm so busy, but I really try to integrate it in terms of the other aspects of what I do as a 
researcher or faculty member. So, mm-hmm. yeah, we uh, we usually use uh, meta analysis uh, as a foundation for developing an intervention program. Uh, especially in in my lab, um, some of my doctor students after they finish like the meta analysis project of their own they will find out, okay, there's some gaps I find out in this meta-analysis and this I'm going to propose to do in like a small scale intervention. I mean, special education, we do a lot of intervention. So, um, and I feel like that is like a smooth transition. It's not really a balance. I think it's like, you know, um, it's a very natural transition from the review to, uh, to the practice. But on a side note, <laughs> when I heard about this question, I just... Re- Remember the other day, I like to play volleyball, you know, during the, you know, after our time. I find mm-hmm. myself when I was taking a break in between the games, I was working on re on my phone. <laughs> Do we exclude, include? <laughs> so I said, right? That's- he does meta analysis the way some people binge watch Netflix. <laughs> I will say. One of the sad things about switching to Ask Review is I can no longer do it on my phone sitting outside drinking a beer. Because that's yeah. how I used to do my screening was on my phone outside with the beer because that I, an hour, you could get a ton done. Yeah. So, yeah. I do that during volleyball break. Yeah. Well, that's, right. that's funny how you call it like binge, binge screening because mm-hmm. I often do binge watching while screening. While screening. Yeah. That's, that happens too. that's how I do it. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I should have asked what everyone's you know preferred beverages are for screen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we're coming up on the end of the hour here. Um, um, so uh, I guess I'll, if, if anyone in the audience, if you've got a super burning question, we can take a take a question or two. Um, and I, uh, if not, uh, panelists, I guess any any last thoughts you want to leave folks with. I was just going to say my experience is that people in this field are really nice. So if you have a question, follow up. So like, I'm sure you could email anybody on this panel, anybody else that's in the audience. I mean, don't be afraid to reach out because people do respond. We're, I mean, I love when people want to ask me questions and ask my opinion about things. I'll tell you my opinion all day. Um, but so don't be afraid to reach out to people to ask, Hey, I'm starting this. What do you think? Do you have advice? How would you approach this? Yeah, that's a uh, definitely consistent with my experience too. It's a great suggestion. Um, oh, so uh, yeah, uh, I guess just a, a, a toolkit question. Uh, Will's wondering. A lot of people use Rayon for like for the initial screening. Um, is there, are there any good tools for like second screening or full text review? <laughs> That, that folks know of. Amanda, you mentioned you use Covidence, right? Yeah, I use Covidence. I was getting the link to the paper I did with Chiang where we actually reviewed them all too. So I was oh, going to drop yeah, that and see if I see the, the good paper. List. Good yeah. paper. The gray paper. Yeah. yeah. Well, we just got to get Covidence. Josh Palandin on this. Hurry up, Josh. Yeah. <laughs> or you have it, I guess, in Meta Reviewer. Yeah, Covidence, I think if you want to be creative, <laughs> there could be like, you can maybe use a few free trials on yeah. different email accounts if you are resourceful. <laughs> These are the tips we're here for. <laughs> scratch <laughs> scratch that off the, uh, yeah. off the recording. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. We, yeah. Okay, we'll, or, we'll, or you we'll find a friend who has an institutional license yeah. and who you add to the project and oh. then yeah, only definitely. one person needs the license. Definitely take that off the recording. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, meta reviewer. Meta reviewer. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Okay. So, so before we get in before we get in any more trouble, uh we'll just say <laughs> we'll end it there. Uh thank you all, Amanda, Pong Pong, Carlton, for uh, for joining us. This has been uh really fun for me and I I think really uh helpful for the uh for our community. Um, we've got uh, we've got a bunch more uh, talks coming up in our in our online seminar series uh, next month. Uh, we're going to be at a special time. We're going to do an early seminar, nine a.m. Central instead of eleven a.m. Uh, because we'll, we're going to be joined by Dr. Mike Chung from the National University of Singapore. So he is literally halfway around the world 
Uh, he's going to come share with us um, his expertise on fitting flexible meta analytics models with structural equation modeling. So join us for that. All the details are on our website. Thanks all for, for coming. All right, bye. Thanks.